Hi everyone, I'm Maggie McGrath, editor of Forbes Women, and we are here at the NASDAQ market site with Gina Bartesi. She is the founder and executive chair of KindBody. It's a leading fertility company, female founded, female led, and it was just named as the Women Presidents Organization's number one fastest growing company. <music> Gina, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you, Maggie. Uh, thank you, Forbes, and thank you, WPO, for the recognition. We'll get into the recognition and exactly how you achieved that, but I have heard you referred to as the OG fertility entrepreneur. And in fact, you founded your first fertility company in 2009, which, if we take a look back, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine did not declare egg freezing as anything more than experimental until 2013. So you were a few years before that. What was the business opportunity you saw when founding that first fertility company? Yeah, I think I look like um, many New Yorkers. We're here at NASDAQ in the heart of New York City. Uh, and it's not just New Yorkers, right? But I was in my mid-30s. I was not married. Um, I met my husband out east. Uh, we dated a couple of years, and then we got married um, at 38. And um, to me, again, as a serial entrepreneur, I've always looked to solve problems. And when you're in your late 30s, you assume you're healthy, you eat well, that fertility is not going to be an issue. Um, but it is. Uh, your age is the number one predictor of whether or not you're going to have success. So um, I did. I started a company uh, in 2009. Uh, there's been quite a bit of change since 2009. Uh, the fertility industry in and of itself is still a relatively young industry. It's only about three decades old. So lots of change in the last 15 years and certainly a tremendous amount of change over the last three decades. And change is coming at a more rapid pace. Talk about change. I saw a report that says the fertility industry globally is expected to hit $84 billion by 2028, and that's just one report. How are you navigating this change specifically through KindBody? Yeah, so the change is macroeconomic driven, right? I talked about not being the only female in their mid 30s living in New York City as a single uh, female. I used to think when I first got into the industry that the fertility industry only affected bi coast women in large cities. That it was in New York and LA and San Francisco. And what we know today is that it affects everyone in the United States. And in fact, it's a global issue. Uh, a decade ago, one in eight couples struggled with fertility. Today, that is one in five. And so you just see these macroeconomic trends as women wait until longer to get married. They wait to have children. Same sex couples are having children at a um, at a rate never before seen. And so you just have these macroeconomic reasons uh, uh, of the growth in the fertility industry. Um, what's, uh, where that came from to start Kind Body is uh, lessons learned from my previous company. My previous company is a public company. It's the only fertility company that's public, that's progeny. And employers today really want to buy direct. They want to buy direct from doctors. They want to buy you know, if you, we look at digital health, which was wildly popular over the last five years, we would call those digital health, those care navigation solutions, kind of V1, right? V1 in the industry. Kind body and actually being in the provision of care. Today we have 34 fertility clinics around the country. We'll have 37 by the end of the summer. Um, what employers want today is the ability to effectuate cost, quality, and outcome, and you can only do that by being in the provision of care. So we really think about Kind Body and serving today's uh, women's health and fertility needs as V2, as the next iteration, a much better, uh, smarter mousetrap that the employers have been asking for uh, for certainly more than five years, almost a decade now, is this direct contracting solution. So you directly employ doctors? We do. The be well, the best, in my opinion. I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm a little biased, for sure. Um, but yes, we have our own um, doctors, uh, reproductive endocrinology and infertility specialists who are double certified in both REI and OBGYN, um, and our clinical care team. So our doctors are supported by outstanding PAs and NPs and MAs and sonographers and nurses. So it is an entire clinical care team that envelops the patient to ensure kindness. Uh, when I went through fertility treatment, my boys, I have twin boys, they'll be 13 next month. But um, I found a lack of empathy and kindness in healthcare. And when I would go into any clinic, um, the doctors were white, they wore white coats, the walls were white. And I was like, wow, this is white. And this has to be 
our mission at Kind Body is to is to democratize fertility care, is to make it more affordable for all. Uh, black, brown, purple, straight, trans, gay, everybody should have access to fertility treatment. And I just, after the experience I had where there was a lack of empathy and everything seemed very homogenous, we wanted to democratize care so that even the cashier at Walmart could afford fertility treatment. How do you do that? Because fertility treatment can cost fifteen, twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars, depending on a person's situation, depending on their insurance, depending on their location. How, how are you bringing that cost down? And what is the average cost for a kind body customer? Yeah. So the the number one thing that drives whether that price is fifteen, twenty, twenty-five is the doctor. Okay, the doctor sets his or her own prices. They could deliver care for $10,000, $15,000, $25,000, $30,000. So in order to effectuate change in healthcare specific to what it's going to cost the employer or the, the employee or the patient, you have to be in the provision of care. So that was, again, when, when I was sitting in the middle, I couldn't really um, tell the doctors what to take in terms of reimbursements. MCOs, managed care organizations and payers have a similar challenge. Um, the doctors will be in or out of network depending on reimbursements, but only the, doc the doctor can control for cost. So once I learned that only the doctor could control for cost and our mission was to bring down the cost of care, we are in the provision of care intentionally. We utilize technology. We have our own proprietary patient portal and electronic medical record. It's called Kind EMR. So we use technology to bring down the cost, and our cost will save the average uh, employer uh, 20 to 25 percent, and the patient see the same savings. Interesting. And I think Kind Body reported that it was on track for $180 million in revenue for fiscal 2023. As we started this conversation saying WPO named Kind Body as the fastest growing female led startup within its organization. What is driving that growth? Is it the technology? Is it the healthcare evolution? Is it consumer demand? Is it all of the above? Yeah, it is all of the above. So at Kind Body, we serve three constituencies. We serve employers. We have a 122 large employers. Um, we also serve patients. About 20% of our patient population are consumers that just walk into our locations off the street. And then our third revenue channel after employers and patients are the MCOs. Uh, we are in network with all of the large major payers. And they're seeing this tremendous growth. The growth in the industry is driven by patient demand, right? Um, many patients a decade or more um, didn't freeze eggs, didn't go through IVF. Same-sex couples um, lived more often than night child-free or they adopted. Today, those same-sex couples have access to fertility treatment through our own in-house surrogacy adoption services. So we really offer an end-to-end -end care delivery and solution for employers or patients. So everything's vertically integrated. If you need PGT, uh, pre-implantation genetic testing for your embryos, surrogacy, um, men's health, we do all male infertility services. So what we wanna do again is envelop the patient um, in kindness and make sure they're not shuffled from one provider to the other in the healthcare industry, that's pretty common and, and you lose sight, you lose care for that patient. And at Kind Body, the goal is to keep that patient under the same roof, so to make the patient journey significantly easier and kinder on the patient. And to have a holistic look at the healthcare picture. And to have a holistic look. Uh, in fact, our whole women's healthcare solution is called Kind Body 360, right? We want you to be 360 holistic care. We've talked about the growth of the industry. I feel like I get a new pitch for a new fertility company in my inbox every week. How are you navigating the competitive landscape when there are so many new entrants looking to do similar work? Yeah, we welcome new entrants. Um, for us to win, no one else has to lose. It is that early in the game of kind of this fertility knowledge, fertility industry. So we like um, the companies coming into the space. You know, I. Uh, do a fair amount of um, mentoring young female entrepreneurs. And as long as the new entrants, when they really first start a company, they need to t think in terms of scale, right? You mentioned the 180 million last year, we're tracking to you know, close to 250 million this year. We had our first profitable month 
last month after you invest heavily. It's called the J curve in venture capital financing. You invest in the business, you invest in the business, and then there's this vertical access, excuse me, the horizontal access, and that's your break even line. So we were profitable last, uh, last month in March of 2024, which we're incredibly proud of. But, you know, we want these new entrants to come. I think, you know, when, when I want to uh, and take great um, pleasure in mentoring young, particularly female founders, just think in terms of scales. The first thing I ask um, young female entrepreneurs is, how big can your business get? And when they say, can get $10 million, that used to be, I mean, $10 million is a lot of money for sure, but that's not a venture-backed business. I mean, $10 million is actually not a very big number for venture investors to put money behind. They need to be thinking in terms of multi-billion dollar exit strategies. So how big can KindBody get to throw? Um, KindBody is a multi-billion dollar company. Uh, we think about expansion efforts outside of the United States. Certainly our employers have global employees. We serve those today via a network, but I anticipate you'll see KindBody London and KindBody Dublin and KindBody Singapore. Uh, within the next three to five years. So as we talk about geographic expansion, I'm curious about jurisdictional rules on reproductive health. Earlier this year, we saw the ruling out of the Alabama Supreme Court that affected IVF. Globally, it gets more complicated, but just let's talk about here at home. How is the American political landscape affecting the way you think about building and growing your business? Yeah, well, we will continue to be vigilant in our um, efforts and in our mission to make sure that all women and men have high quality care to build the family they want. So we are in the family building industry. Um, certainly when Alabama passed a, a ruling uh, prohibiting IVF and IVF centers in Alabama took a pause. Um, at that time, I think there were some questions about IVF, uh, particularly in the red states. Um, what was um, great for the industry and a real reward for our patient population is that this was a bipartisan issue that they actually reversed that decision in Alabama and they are now protecting IVF and fertility doctors. So again, what was um, something we didn't anticipate um, is bipartisan support. You saw both Republicans and Democrats come out pretty um, irreverent uh, in protecting IVF and uh, everybody's wants to build more families. And so, um, particularly with a declining population, right? I mean, the United States, other countries have declining populations. So today, um, the concern that was exhibited, you know, six weeks ago when the Alabama ruling came through, um, that same concern does not exist today. So your customers don't seem as confused as they were. They don't. We see utilization continuing to increase across all states, across the United States. And then again, as we think about expanding globally, you see increased utilization, increased patient volume uh, in Canada, in the UK, in Europe, in Australia, in other developed countries, but then in other um, developing countries as well. So um, again, what you, you learn is fertility is not a, you know, white, heterosexual, 1% privileged benefit. It used to be. Uh, it should not be any longer. It affects everybody. And so at Kind Body, our mission remains to democratize care so that everybody can afford the family they want. So you achieved profitability in March. And I, I was curious, because if you think about the variabilities of the human body and biology, how do you balance profitability and the search for profitability with all the variabilities that can come with egg retrieval, with successful IVF procedures, with how much patients are willing to pay? Yeah, I think uh, most importantly, you have to stay close to your patient, your consumer, right? Uh, and you have to listen to them. Um, you have to listen to your teammates. Uh, the success of any business, I've always said, is about people. And at Kind Body, um, our clinical team members are the, really the ones that are taking care of our patients. And so if we say we can prioritize taking care of our clinical team members, our clinical team members will take care of our patients. If we take care of our patients, they'll take care of our profits. So it's in that order, right? Teammates, patients, profits for our investors. You are a founder of five different companies, so I think that qualifies you as a serial entrepreneur. I want to ask you about the first one, because it happened while you were a student at UNC. You not only founded it, but there was an acquisition. Tell us about that first entrepreneurial experience. Yeah, um, I grew up in a very middle-class family in North Carolina, and 
Um, I needed to make some extra income. I waited tables, but I also wanted to make some extra income. So I was an artist, so I would paint. I painted the 18 bars in Chapel Hill. And my dad was like, I sent you to college and you painted the 18 bars? How do you know about these bars? Or Anyway, um, I knew about the bars. But uh, so I painted this canvas and then made prints of it and sold the prints to um, other students. But what it taught me is this grit and determination from the very beginning to bootstrap. I think the entrepreneurs who start with bootstrap businesses first and then go on to raise venture capital have a, a better understanding of a P&L, the grit, the hard work, the determination, the work ethic that it takes to get something to scale. But no kidding, yeah, it was they sold like hotcakes and then um, one of my girlfriend's fathers was like, I'll buy this company from you. And he bought it, it was like $3,400, which was a lot of money to a college student. So he was like, I'll buy it for $3,400. I didn't even think I negotiated. I was like, $3,400 sold. <laughs> I probably should have negotiated. But anyway, it was a lot of money to a senior at Chapel Hill. So. That, that would have been a lot of money to me as a yeah. senior as well. Well, that's a good learning experience and it sounds like it gave you the entrepreneurial itch. What do you think is the number one learning you've had as a serial entrepreneur and that you would advise anyone watching this who wants to become an entrepreneur themselves? Yeah, we've talked a little bit about it, but nothing's going to be hard work and dedication, um, humility, finding like-minded people. I think um, when you're interviewing others, if they say, I need work-life balance and I don't work on the weekends and I don't work after hours, um, it's hard to build a startup with that mentality. So you have to find like-minded teammates who are ready to run through a brick wall to create more um, families for those who have previously been able to uh, been unable to afford uh, building their families. So, um, but those are things: is is finding like-minded teammates. Uh, finding a like-minded family, friends, others who understand. I can't do this because I made the other decision to do this, and and you know it's been. I will tell you the other thing is, as you get older, it does get easier, right? It gets easier to fundraise. It gets easier to spot new hires. It gets easier to spot um, answers for challenges. Every business has challenge uh, challenges, but most of the challenges we face at Kind Body or any company. You know, I've, I've been at this a while, and most of the challenges uh, we have, I've seen before. So you can get to the answer faster. But I'm going to tell you again that returning to your customer and what's most important in this case at Kind Body for your patient is going to drive the right, right outcome for any entrepreneur any time. Stay close to your customer. Interesting. It's interesting that you say that it's gotten easier. We ask a lot of the women who've been on the 50 over 50 <laughs> if their work is easier as someone over 50 or if it's harder because of their age, because age discrimination is a thing. But it sounds like experience has been a boon to you and your business. It has. I, again, I think in other congratulations on the Forbes 50 over 50, the list was fantastic. And I saw, like, I can imagine some of the um, actresses and celebrities where it may be a disadvantage to be you know on a show today as an actress in the business world it actually gets much easier um, you're comfortable in the boardroom you're comfortable with financial statements so uh, it is a benefit I don't think I'm the only one that would say that any other 50 year old plus CEO executive they don't even have to be a CEO they would just say um, with age comes wisdom, and with wisdom comes confidence, and that's what it really takes to be a successful C-suite executive in today's market. If we speak a year from now, you know, you were just named the fastest growing company within the WPO. What do you wish to be able to report to me about Kind Body's growth and or the fertility industry as a whole? Yeah, we remain on this mission to um, continue to democratize care. I still think, you know, there are these fertility deserts, and we think about how we can serve care in the Dakotas, in Wyoming. How can we bring more care and more convenience to patients at home? Uh, we shouldn't require patients to come into the clinic if there's an easier way for them to access treatment from home. So I think in a year from now, um, from a patient standpoint, again, is creating more convenience and more accessibility to the patients. Um, I think from a business standpoint, from an investor standpoint, um, kind body, we'll, we'll see how the public markets look in 2025. Uh, what's great for Kind Body is we're EBITDA positive. The next milestone in the journey of a, of a company is to be cash flow positive. Uh, delighted to share with Forbes and you, Maggie, no one else knows this yet, but we're anticipating to be cash flow positive 
uh, six months from now. So before the end of the year, we'll be both EBITDA positive and cash flow positive. What that means for a public offering in 2025 is that we can decide when the time for us to go is. We don't have any investors. We have very patient capital. Our investors have been strong supporters to our team and to the mission of the company. So if the public markets really reopen, there have been a few IPOs in 2024, but if they come back in a more robust fashion, Kind Body will certainly be in a position to go public, uh, but we'll, we'll take our time. We'll have a tremendous alignment amongst our team members again in that same order against our, with our team members and our clinical care team. Our patients are excited for us, and then our investors will kind of come last because they, our investors clearly understand if we take care of our teammates and our patients, everything else will come. So what I'm hearing is we might be meeting at the NASDAQ again in the future. We may. Uh, we love NASDAQ. We also love the NYSC. So there are two great exchanges uh, to take a company public. Well, Gina, thank you for joining us at NASDAQ today. We so appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you, Maggie. Thank you, NASDAQ. And thank you, WPO.